Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to open our alumni lunchtime webinar presented by Professor Caleb Gardner. Caleb is a fisheries scientist and the Director of Sustainable Marine Research at the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Science at the University of Tasmania. My name is Michaela Lightfoot and I'm part of the alumni team here at the University of Tasmania working in the role of Senior Alumni Relations Officer within the Advancement Unit. The Alumni Office is committed to providing our alumni and supporters globally with meaningful ways to connect to their university and engaging them more deeply in an ongoing conversation about the groundbreaking research being done at the university. These webinars are also an opportunity to introduce you to the staff and alumni who are playing key roles in that research, people who are highly valued within our institution. This webinar will form a living record for the university, which you'll be able to access from the university's website. Thank you for taking the time today to hear from just one of our experts from the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Science, also known as IMAS, Professor Caleb Gardner. IMAS is a centre of excellence for marine and Antarctic research. Their research cuts across traditional scientific and social scientific boundaries. They are dedicated to enhancing environmental understanding and facilitating thoughtful and sustainable development for the benefit of Australia and the world. IMAS has three core research programs, being fisheries and aquaculture, ecology and biodiversity, and oceans and cryosphere. Caleb's research is mainly on high value invertebrate fisheries such as the southern rock lobster and abalone. His qualifications in both economics and biology interact in his research on commercial fisheries. His research on wild fishery species generally has the objective of ensuring sustainable production and community benefit for Australia's fisheries. This has included the increased use of bioeconomic models in coastal fisheries for setting catches and assessing other regulations. Caleb first studied science at the University of Adelaide and then worked in human pathology in the UK and Sydney. He then moved to Tasmania to study aquaculture at UTAS, doing a graduate diploma, honours and PhD and eventually moving on to wild fisheries research. In 2010, he completed undergraduate studies and then a master's by research in economics in response to the need to consider economic approaches in harvest strategies. He has worked in a range of positions at the University of Tasmania, including as a program leader for fisheries and currently as director of the Sustainable Marine Research Collaboration Agreement, which is the partnership agreement between the Tasmanian Government and the University for Fisheries Research Services. Following Caleb's formal presentation, we will allow time for some questions from listeners. You are welcome to post questions via the chat box underneath the presentation on your screen. Please note you will need to be logged in to live stream to use that chat facility. All of your questions will be visible to other listeners and due to time constraints we will choose just a few. Now over to you, Caleb. Very good. Thanks, Michaela. Um, yeah, and hello to all the alumni. It's, um, we've seen, well, I've seen a list of some of the people logging in and some of them my old mates who I studied with, so that's really nice. Um, anyway, I'll get on with it. So I'm talking about Australia's commercial fisheries and what's holding them back. Um, and just to get the show on the road, I'll just really try to make the case that things are being held back and that we're not really producing as much as what we could if we, if we really wanted to. Um, so... To give you a sense of that, first of all, just to point out that Australia's got quite a small population in terms of the scale of our, um, of our coastline. Um, we've got 23 million people or so, um, but we've got this extremely large coastline. Depends how you measure it, um, but in terms of total area, we're about a third of the, the world's, about third largest in the world behind France and the USA. Um, or um, if you just think about the coastal shelf, which is particularly important for fisheries because these are the shallow waters where most of the fisheries production occurs, um, again, we're the third largest there. We're behind Russia and Canada, but still with a really quite massive 2.2 million square kilometres of coastal shelf. Um, and in fact, the number's even larger if you think about the fact that we, we lay claim to this um, Australian Antarctic Territory. So there's around another $2 million of shelf area down there which we could harvest if we, from if we wanted to. Um, 
although um, although still that particular area is only recognised by a few other countries, France, UK, New Zealand and Norway. But nonetheless, um, point being, we, we have a very large area um, of coastal shelf which could be harvested and contribute to fisheries resources if we wanted to. So, so we have this big area, um, but interestingly, and, and third largest, as I've said a few times, but interestingly, we are right down the list, though, in terms of um, our actual fisheries production. So we're only the 55th largest producing nation. Now, if you put those two numbers together, the amount of area which we have in our total production, um, well, you can sort of get a sense on how much production we're producing, how much fish we're harvesting from each square kilometre of our coastal shelf, this, these regions of inshore areas that are particularly important for productivity. If you think about things in that way, um, Australia's production is extraordinarily low. We are producing only around 107 kilograms per square kilometres of coastline. Um, and so there's only other, one other country which produces less than that, and that's Eritrea, because they have problems with pirates and, and war and so on. So there's very good reasons why they're not harvesting very much from their coastal shelf. Um, but it really begs the question, you know, why are we down in that category of those of, um, of people who are similarly in that sort of area? Um, so that's um, so we have this very low production, and in fact, I, I produced this graph first of all uh, for when I was in Indonesia, um, and you can see that you might be able to see. I'll see if I can show it there. There's a little red bar there. That's Indonesia, um, one of our um, closest neighbouring countries. They produce around 10 tonnes per square kilometre, so we're one percent roughly of the level of productivity that they're getting out of their coastal shelf. So we're extremely low. Um, here's something else as well, um, this gets discussed a lot in the fisheries and seafood space, the way that Australia's seafood consumption is so strongly reliant on imported seafood. So we have all this coast, we have a very small population and yet the seafood we eat is mainly coming from overseas. It's around 75% at the moment of the seafood we eat um, is produced somewhere else in the world. Um, so that's this. That's this brown line there, and the point being the brown line, the imports is much higher than our domestic supply. So it sort of really begs the question, why are we producing so little and why are we so reliant on seafood production elsewhere? Um, and this, and I'm certainly not the first person to talk about this, in fact it gets discussed all the time in marine science, and there's the usual old, two old explanations I hear all the time. One is that we have very low environmental productivity in Australia, we don't have much rainfall, and that means there's not rivers taking a whole lot of... Um, silt and nutrients out into the sea, we don't have glaciation grinding up rocks and putting nutrients into the sea, we don't have upwellings and so there's sort of this environmental limitation that people talk about. Um, and then people also say well we've had fisheries going for many years and everything's a disaster we've kind of run out of fish. Um, so I'm not sure both of those actually hold up that much if we look at them. So. Um, but those, those two points get pulled out all the time and they're quite negative in terms of um, their impact on, on perceptions of seafood consumption in Australia. This, is, this article was in the Australian Medical Journal a couple of years ago um, and the, the, case, well, the, the authors there were trying essentially to make the case that although seafood is really healthy for people, um, they were saying it's irresponsible of the medical community to say we should be eating seafood because Australia just can't supply it all and so it's... Um, you know, we should be trying to in fact, discourage people to eat seafood because we have to import all this seafood at the moment and it's not sustainable and so that should all cease. So I, th I, think it's, I think the point here is that it's important the way that people perceive limitations in seafood in Australia because it influences what people buy and if you think about this particular study, it influences people's health as well if we're holding them back from eating seafood. <clears throat> so that's the basis for the talk. Um, we do have this extraordinarily low level of seafood production from our extraordinarily large level of coastal shelf. Um, and so, you know, why are we, why are we are not producing more? And I've, I've come up with seven reasons which I'll, I'll walk through in this talk. Um, first of those, I've already touched on the fact that people often say there's biological constraints on production. And look, I've, I've got to agree with that. That is a point. Um, but I'm just going to make the case in this talk that there's a lot of other things as well. So. We do have um, fairly modest primary productivity in Australia. Um, there's this, this map shows levels of primary productivity around the world. Um, Australia does tend to be fairly low. Um, I think it gets overstated though. You know, you can look at that map, you can see with some areas around our coastline which have actually got pretty good levels of primary productivity. We do have a fairly narrow continental shelf, um, that's true, so other places like New Zealand for example has got some really very broad areas of continental shelf that are important for their fisheries production but even despite having a, a narrow continental shelf we've still got 
um, more than almost um, every other country in the world, bar two. So, um, so primary productivity, yeah, that's some constraint, but it, there's more to it. Um, also, if you look around the world, there's plenty of other countries that have got almost no rainfall, no big rivers, or um, have got other reasons um, why their fisheries production should be low, but they're still producing 20 times more um, per area of shelf than what we're doing. So some examples like Morocco or Turkey or Maldives, Yemen, Italy, Sudan, in fact the list just goes on and on. Um, so simply just saying we don't have this um, sort of biological productivity does not explain our low levels of fisheries harvest by any means. Um, and you can also look at the countries that are neighbouring us. So these are countries which in fact are sharing very similar ecosystems to us in many cases. Um, East Timor, Indonesia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, these are all countries um, sort of in our region. All of them are producing at least double um, per square kilometre of their coastal shelf is what we're doing. East Timor in this plot looks fairly similar to us, but even they're, they're double us. Um, and you can see there's obviously political reasons um, and just economic reasons why East Timor's productivity has been limited. Um, but Indonesia, I just I mentioned that one earlier, but I just find that extraordinarily a really interesting comparison. 100 times more product production from their shelf is, than what we're doing. Um, so to understand what's really going on, um, I think you've got to also to think about what the, the global seafood production trends are. Um, this particular plot shows the wild capture production um, from the whole globe. And this plot gets produced or shown all the time in fisheries talks. Um, and people always make the point that over the last um, 20 years or so, the global wild capture production has, um, has been very flat. Um, and then people will usually go on and, and draw all sorts of inferences from that. For example, that all the world's fisheries wild capture production is plateaued and there's no scope for, for further increases in production. Um, and then extrapolate from that down to the Australian situation and say we're probably in a similar situation, we're probably flatlined and that's just the, the way it is. Um, and usually this plot's also teamed up with something like this. This shows the status of global fish stocks and um, the, the point's usually made there's a lot of overfish stocks and a lot of them are fully fished and not many that are underutilised and again um, people interpret this to say we've sort of hit a plateau in production. On this particular one, um, I don't have time to go into detail, but um, by definition an overfish stock is a stock that's not producing as much as what it could, so I just use that to illustrate that these, these plots can often get misinterpreted or at least people twist them and interpret it in their own particular way. Um, but, we, but we do have this flat line of production um, globally. Um, and so to understand what's going on, I think it's important to, to be clear, for most people who are buying fish, a fish is a fish. Um, they don't particularly care whether it's wild caught or, or even know whether it's wild caught harvest or whether it's produced in aquaculture. Um, so this is an Australian supermarket's display and you've got a range of different species there. Some of them are, are wild capture, some of them are aquacultured, but for most people they wouldn't care about the source, they just care whether it's a, a prawn or, a, or what particular type of fish it is and the price. Um, what that means, if you're thinking about total production of fish, we also need to think about aquaculture production and aquaculture production over the last 20 years has been rocketing up at an extraordinary, unbelievable rate. Um, so that's global production you put of aquaculture. Combine that with the wild fisheries capture production and you have a plot like this. This shows the trend in total seafood being produced by the world through time. And it's been rocketing up at an extraordinary rate. In fact, it's been growing at around four times um, that is, the supply has been growing at around four times the rate of global population growth. So one way to think about that is we've got supply growing much, much faster than what the, uh, the rate of growth in demand has been going. Um, so what that means is if you're a producer of seafood, this is a really difficult operating environment to be in. You've got all this extra production and supply flowing into a market and that's a very difficult place to be as if you, if you are a wild capture um, harvester of seafood. Um, so so I, I just think this particular plot is, is really interesting. It just shows just what, what extraordinary growth we've got in seafood production. Um, and it's one of these things, again, sometimes I think I'm sort of working quite a surreal space in fishery science because a lot of people show this plot and yet still somehow say we have a crisis in fisheries and seafood production around the world. Um, but I, I'm not sure there's any other food commodity which is growing at such an extraordinary rate and exceeding supply at such an amazing rate, sorry, exceeding demand. Um, so 
Um, so my first, my second point I wanted to say on what's holding commercial fisheries back is just this external factor and that is the world is producing a lot more fish, that growth is coming through improvements in technology and in aquaculture production and so we have competition. That's a difficult place to be in if you want to try increasing production. It's a very challenging environment. Um, and you can see evidence of this effect and, and why it would be a difficult place to operate in in terms of price. So if you have supply increasing at a rapid rate much more rapid than the growth in demand, then Economics 101, just basic micro, um, would say that price should go down. So here are the, the price indices of all the, the range of categories that are tracked by, um, attract in Australia, and these are used for calculating the national CPI. Um, and I've, I've plotted them all up here, all the different categories that are shown. You can see three down the bottom here. Well, most of the food categories have been more or less just, just plotting along through time, just following the standard rate of, or just um, average rate of inflation across the country. <clears throat> but three have had really different patterns. One of them is fruit, so that's banana productions, um, really gone up in the last few years, and that's what's driving that pattern. Um, we're also seeing vegetable um, real prices have gone down. I'm not entirely sure what that is, to be honest, although I think it's um, to do with technology and tomato production and just supply chains and logistics of, of supplying tomatoes in particular. Um, but here's the one we're interested in. It's this line here, which is the seafood um, production. So here we've got a decline in real price of seafood through time. Um, so there's a real signal of competition. That's the sort of the data. Um, but I, I and, so, and so you can see this is a difficult place to be for producers. But just in my day-to-day -day job and moving between different fisheries um, and different research projects, you can just see this playing out all the time. And so. On the one hand, I get you, you'll hear a lot of talks and people saying we're running out of seafood, but my day-to-day -day experience is quite the opposite, where normally if I'm speaking with industry people or producers, they're worried about um, having not, not having enough, rather, they're not, they're not so concerned about not having fish, they're concerned about not being able to sell it. Um, so here's an example. Australian salmon used to be canned. Um, when I was a boy, I regularly had, um, you know, pasta with Australian salmon out of cans on it. Um, and all the fisheries, or sorry, all the canneries for that closed down about 20 years ago now. We have a lot of licenses still for Australian salmon. Most of them are not used. Um, the little bit of harvesting that still continues is mainly just to supply into the lobster bait market because that's one of the few markets they can find for it. Um, and yet we've got record high stocks of Australian salmon. So, um, you know, real good indication of just the difficulty of trying to market seafood, not supply. Here's some other ones. Um, the eastern tuna fishery, only around 50% of the quota for that was taken last year. Even more extreme on the other side of the country in Western Australia, only around 4% of the western tuna fishery quota was taken. Um, and the skipjack tuna, so this is the most important tuna in the world um, for the canning market, we've had no catch taken since 2009 in the Australian skipjack tuna. So we have large resources across all these tuna stocks and it's just not commercially viable to harvest a lot of them. <coughs> um, um, so if you are going to harvest or, or try, to try to compete in this challenging world, obviously it's important to have costs low. So this is where a lot of the countries neighbouring us do well because they have lower labour costs. Um, Papua New Guinea harvests 200,000 tonnes of tuna. That's a, that's a huge catch of fish. Um, 200,000 tonnes of tuna are harvested in Papua New Guinea. Um, and then on the other side of the border, here we have the Australian area just south of it. This line looks like there's some catch taken on the Australian side, but there's not. Uh, we have nothing taken across that region, zero catch. Um, and in fact, not only do we have zero catch, we've in fact have shut the door on taking any future catch from that region with the Coral Sea MPA, um, which has been declared fairly recently. So um, we'll get on to that later on. But that's just you know, in the sense that that's also a political barrier to increasing production. Um, but you can just see that we have these resources around um, and they're just not being harvested. Here's some more sardines, um, large stocks of Australian sardines um, in off Tasmania, New South Wales and Victoria are known to be there. They're just not harvested, they're not viable. Um, this is a species called the giant spider crab, almost identical species is harvested in large tonnages in Europe. Um, we've got large stocks of them in Australia but we just, they're just not viable to harvest commercially. Um, you just can't find the markets. Uh, this is a species blue cod which were harvested in some of the Southern Ocean territories of Australia around the Krogan Plateau. They, they were harvested in the 70s by a Russian fleet. Um, so we have access to these resources today but there's just not the markets for them. And this species at the top is a particularly interesting one. This is a lanternfish or a mctophid. 
Um, there are those incredible biomasses of these in the Southern Ocean, something like 6 million tonnes of them is one estimate of the biomass. Um, to put that into context, that's about three times the global seafood production. Um, and we don't harvest any of them. You know, we don't harvest a tonne of those. Nobody does um, because they're not a particularly nice fish to eat. Um, they could be harvested and used for fish meal, but the market for fish meal isn't, that, um, isn't enough to make that fishery viable. So we have these stocks around um, which are just sort of effectively outcompeted by production elsewhere in the globe. On a very local level, right down into Tasmania now, um, I see this, um, you know, well these are, I'm about to show you some fish stocks here which we assess here at IMAS and we provide the guidance on these to the state government to help manage. Um, and fishery after fishery or stock after stock, um, the catches have just been going down over the last couple of decades because they're, um, it's hard to compete against in the global market. So leather jackets um, up here, uh, yellow-eyed mullet, pike, whiting, these are all species which are um, considered sustainable, class of sustainable, we've got regional stocks of them but they're just, they're just not being harvested anymore. <coughs> Australian salmon I've already talked about, barracuda, boarfish, um, flathead, they're perhaps more stable over the last few years but flounder have really plummeted and even garfish have gone down in, in production over the last few years. Um, and so these are the declining catches of all these are just simply being driven by this by competition, by this difficult operating environment. That can be competition from product imported from overseas, like these Vasa fillets or um, or white shrimp, um, or it can be from local agriculture production. So Atlantic salmon um, has increased production dramatically over recent years. Atlantic salmon can be supplied every day, regularly, known sizes, and not surprisingly, restaurants and other um, buyers of seafood um, gravitate towards Atlantic salmon because it's just easy to fit into a business model compared to some of these other um, wild caught stocks. So, you know, why are we having less production of uh, some of these wild caught stocks? It's just just the the operating environment. <coughs> um, part of the part of the, the reason that uh, competition has become important also has been through the whole globalisation and increase in um, um, sophistication of supply chains and um, and transport routes. Um, and I, don't, I think a lot of people don't appreciate just how, how globally traded and, and how efficient some of these global um, supply chains are. I'll give you an example here. This is a species called blue whiting, so they're harvested in New Zealand um, and you can buy them just down the road here at the supermarkets um, and they're a very cheap um, and quite a nice product to eat. So they're, um, they're harvested in New Zealand and bought over here and I suspect when most people walk into the supermarket down here at Sandy Bay in, in Hobart they probably think um, the product's just been caught here, processed somewhere in New Zealand and shipped across to us. Um, the reality is very different. What actually happens with blue, blue whiting is they're harvested in New Zealand, shipped all the way up to China um, to be filleted and processed and then just the, the pure boneless fillets are then shipped all the way back again to Australia. And they're still, this is where the whole transport routes are so incredible nowadays, they're still shipped back to Australia and the price per kilo is still only $10 per kilogram of these pure boneless fillets. Um, it's incredible. So, um, and in fact in the same supermarket even the dog food is more expensive than these whitings which have been shipped around the world. <coughs> so seafood production um, is global um, and highly competitive and that's driving a lot of our patterns that we have in supply. Um, <clears throat> um, seafood is not just one product, not just one thing, it's a whole mix of different species um, and so we have um, within Australia or everywhere we have some species that are highly desirable and a, an example I have here is snapper um, and at the other extreme we have things like bearded rock cod. Um, I picked this one because we used to actually have a fishery for bearded rock cod in Tasmania, in the north of the state. Um, they are a species that could be harvested near Launceston and sold into the local market. Um, but as fish could be transported better even within Tasmania, that fishery died out decades ago. Um, but it's an example of a fish which we can eat, which we've got, but isn't that great and certainly not as nice as snapper. So we have species like snapper where there's greater demand um, and therefore higher price, there tends to be more profit in the, in the industry um, and that uh, altogether pushes up the fishing risk. Um, so for Australian fisheries managers it's really just these species right at the top, it's these highly desirable ones is where all the action is um, and where all the risk is and, and, and issues in terms of trying to manage them. Um, so in this competitive market where we can only concentrate on highly priced fish, uh, the Australian seafood industry overall has got traits exactly like you would expect 
in, a, in an operating system like that. We have production that's mainly low volume um, and mainly high value species. So most of our production in terms of both tonnages and, um, and value in Australia comes from rock lobster, abalone, southern bluefin tuna, toothfish, um, and also sardines. And they're important simply because they get fed to southern bluefin tuna. Um, right, so so competition, I've spent a lot of time on that, but that's just is, is a really critical driver of production in Australia. Another thing we have, um, this is a, a, I think kind of interesting, is we actually have high biodiversity. Now, high biodiversity sounds like a nice thing, and it is, um, but in terms of fisheries, um, it's actually often, in terms of fishery production, um, it's often good to have low biodiversity. Um, here we've got two fishing, uh, two guides. This is the guide from the Northern Territory and there's an, like a lot of tropical, tropical areas, there's this enormous array of beautiful um, different types of fish. Um, but in contrast, this is a, um, one from the Gulf of Maine where I was just a couple of weeks ago. And the biologists, um, the fisheries biologists in the Gulf of Maine talk about what a, a benefit it is to their fisheries in having very low biodiversity. It means in terms of logistics and trying to run a fishing business, the Northern Territory is a really difficult situation because you can't just send a box full of all different sorts of species of fish off to the, the markets in Sydney where they get sold. Um, the markets require all species ideally to be grayed and all the same size and all the same species within a single consignment. Um, that's quite easy to do in the Gulf of Maine where they've got low biodiversity but really difficult in Australia. So it's just one of these interesting biological quirks that makes things a bit more difficult um, in Australia. Um, than some other places. Um, all right, overfishing also, um, not, a, not a huge issue in Australia, um, and it occurred mainly historically, um, but nonetheless, that's something which um, is, has impacted on the levels of catch which we get out of our stocks today. Um, here's a couple of examples. Commercial scallops um, used to be, um, used to have half, far larger catches um, around southeastern Australia of commercial scallops, but they have been historically overfished and that's affecting our production today. Um, we've largely solved overfishing in Australia, um, but there are still some examples. Giant crabs have shifted into an overfish status over the last few years, so it still occurs. And overfishing uh, means that we're not producing as many as what we could. Um, so like I say, we've transformed Australian fisheries management over the last couple of decades. Um, and we used to have a lot of overfish stocks, and that was a, a real reason um, why um, production was impacted. Famously, the orange ruffy, which were highly depleted. Um, but now overfishing is mostly resolved. This is a fairly recent report from um, on the status of Australian fish stocks, and the key thing there is simply most of the most of that pie chart you can see there is green, which just means most of our stocks are now sustainable. Um, not entirely green. There's a few stocks here which are red, so they're ones which are still classed as overfished, and so it's limiting our production to some extent. Um, what's Here's some evidence of how things have changed. Where we do have stocks that are classed as overfished, importantly, something is happening now. We're not just letting them just roll on and on. Um, so black-lipped abalone across uh, in one of the parts of Victoria was classed as overfished and the catch then wasn't just left to continue on, but the catch was cut by 80%. School sharks were classed as overfished and the catch was almost completely cut. Um, so only 2% only or so of the original catch is still occurring just as a small bycatch provision. Mulloway were classed as overfished off New South Wales. Um, the catch there was cut by 40%, but also they increased the minimum size by 25%, which is a massive amount in terms of size number changes. Um, so the key there is when something needs to happen, it is happening nowadays, and so this is how we're, we're dealing with overfished stocks. So it's a positive story. But that comes back to this chart as well. Overfished stocks are not good for production, clearly, that's obvious, um, but in some ways they're also a positive thing in the sense that they're an opportunity for doing things better into the future. Um, so these, these historically overfished stocks which we have, they actually represent an opportunity for, for perhaps increase in production as those stocks recover. In fact, Orange Ruffy, I, could have, I should have put a picture of those in, but Orange Ruffy are a great example of that. Um, they were terribly managed some time ago. Um, there's been appropriate management changes and they've just recovered extremely well and really quite a positive story in the way that we now um, have got sustainable harvests of orange roughy in, in many areas. Um, all right, so moving on to another reason. Um, when a lot of, some of our fisheries have got quite low catch in them um, and that's not because the catches could not be higher but it's just because we don't want them to be higher. And this is, the thing is we're changing our targets. Um, 20, 30 years ago, the targets for most fisheries was just to try to take as much catch as we could sustainably. 
Nowadays, um, increasingly, we're trying to manage fisheries in Australia for profit rather than for tonnage, and that often means keeping the catch really quite low. Um, a very good example of that recently is Western Rock Lobster. So this is, you can see through through a long period of time, the catch from Western Rock Lobsters was averaging a bit over 10,000 tonnes. I think it was more like 11,000 tonnes through time. Um, but over the last sort of five or so years, the catch is, is much lower, averaging, well, in fact, it's been set at around five and a half or 6,000 tonnes. So um, a very big change, and some people would look at that. So in fact, some people do look at that and say this has been a disaster. These stock is declining dramatically. The catch has been declining dramatically, and that shows the, the stock was overfished or something. Um, but the reality is very different. What's happened is now the, the fishery is targeting high profitability, and that means having very high levels of stock in the water. So every time you go fishing, it doesn't take so much fuel and so much effort um, to take the same amount of tonnage. Um, it also sort of pushes the price up as well into, into markets. So they get a double benefit there economically by keeping the catch very low. You can see the implications on what's happening under the water in terms of their estimates of egg production, and this is a measure of biomass. I've just picked one region here, but um, the, the pattern same, is the same right across the, the areas which they assess in Western Australia, and that is um, this levels of egg production were just trickling along or plodding along at fairly steady um, levels. And then over recent years, as I've wound back the caps, the, the stock has just rocketed up to levels that have never been seen in, in people's memory and perhaps not for 150 years. Um, so there's extraordinary high levels of, of Western rock lobster at the moment, um, whereas the catch um, in some ways tells a very different story. Um, also, um, what another, and this is, this is really a very important reason on why we don't have high catch in Australia, it's just that we make choices about the way we would like our ecosystems to be. We tend to like very pristine ecosystems and that has consequences on how much catch you can take out. Um, so here's, here's a great illustration of that. You've got two areas illustrated here, um, Java in Indonesia. Um, I spent a couple of months last year and then also um, here in the northwest um, of Western Australia. Now, fairly similar areas, but here you've got the plot showing the levels of production. There is actually, if you peer, well, you, there, believe me, there's, Western Australia actually does take some catch from the area, only about 3,000 tonnes, um, but from a pretty similar sized area off Java, which has got a um, very similar ecosystem as well, and um, you would think very similar levels perhaps of productivity, coarsely speaking. Um, they're taking about eight and a half, uh, sorry, 850,000 tonnes. Um, so dramatically different levels of production, um, and it comes down to the choices that we want from our ecosystem. So um, in Indonesia, they want they, they prioritise getting food to feed the community, and, and you can see all the vessels in the background, so they're getting benefits from employment as well. Um, but as a consequence, they're, they're getting a lot of small fish. We would rather have big fish, and that just means having a smaller harvest. So we prefer a pristine ecosystem in Australia, and the consequence of that is lower catch. One of the other things um, which we've made decisions about in Australia is the levels of predators. So we have um, a lot of crocodiles in the northern part of Australia. Um, that just has big implications in terms of a lot of the fisheries that can operate. Um, if you're a barramundi net fisher in the Northern Territory, it's a constant problem. Um, battling against crocodiles. That's a, a very real limitation on production. We also have incredibly high densities of sharks um, in a lot of areas of Australia and that impacts on the, the stocks uh, in terms of it makes it a very difficult thing to operate a business when you, you have your, your um, depredation of the fish which you're trying to land from, from other predators. I'm told from the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation in Australia they get a lot of applications of, of research needs and the biggest issue from the northern half of Australia is these sorts of problems, just having high abundance of predators impacting on fisheries production. So we choose to have crocodiles and we choose to have sharks and, and that's fine but a consequence of that is um, it's harder to operate fishing businesses. Um, <clears throat> All right, now the last, um, so those six things I've run through, but the last one which is um, impacting on our levels of production is just public opposition. I wanted to spend a bit of time on this one because I think it's interesting. Um, I was in Maine a couple of weeks ago um, and Hilary Revel, I think you're on the list. I've pinched this picture of a fire engine from your Facebook page. Um, and so we saw this, Hilary, who was, who's a lobster manager here in Tasmania and I were over there in Maine at, um, looking at the lobster fisheries. Um, 
But you can see there, they've got a picture of the lobster uh, on the side of the fire engine. Um, and everywhere you walk around Maine, um, there's, there's images of lobster everywhere and people just love lobsters and they love the lobster fishing industry and they love the fishing industry generally, really, really supportive of it. Um, um, I also visited Alaska um, recently and they've same sort of thing you get there for their salmon fisher as well. They just love salmon and the community's right behind the fishing industry. Um, there's a lot of love. In contrast, I got back again then from uh, from Maine, and this was in the news. So uh, the situation in Tasmania couldn't be more chalk and cheese in terms of public support for um, seafood producers. This was the whole uh, the fleet of people out protesting against um, uh, one aspect of the salmon industry. Um, another example, same thing happened um, a couple of years ago. I was in Korea. They have a, a mackerel port there, so one part of the, the seafront in Busan. Um, is set aside for landing blue mackerels, they love it. Um, the president, every time she came to town, she would always eat at the, go to that, um, go to that port, eat mackerel, and there was a lot of, so there was a lot of support for mackerel, people liked them, and a lot of support for the seafood industry as a consequence. Um, <clears throat> so that was the blue mackerel fishery in Korea. Blue mackerel fishery in Australia um, was in fact exactly what was to be targeted using the Margiris, so the, you know, the super trawler. So again, chalk and cheese there in terms of we have Korea very supportive of um, a fishing operation in Australia. Um, we, had a, we have a blue mackerel fishery, same species. Um, we had management which was outstanding. We had um, targets that were best practice according to um, the Pew Foundation, Conservation Foundation's um, guidance on how to manage these types of fisheries. Uh, we, had, we had good, great consideration of all the ecosystem interactions of the fishery and the impacts on, on game fish, which also then rely on, the, um, on blue mackerel as a source of prey. Um, the harvest levels were just tiny in terms of the total biomass of the stock, but nonetheless, um, a lot of a lot of opposition there to the fishery. So this was this was going to be a video which is not going to run, but um, you you all know the story, I think. Anyway, the Majerus, of course, came over, and this was just a series of all the news clips that happened, um, and of course, it was such a massive story. And the, the main point, there was such massive opposition um, to this fishing operation, and so different to to what happens in other places. So. A consequence of this lack of community support, which we often see for commercial fisheries in Australia, um, well, it ultimately trickles down and affects the amount of production which we get. Um, because lack of community support for commercial fisheries um, translates into um, the ability or, or, or the ease for political um, processes to close areas to commercial fishing, say for marine parks. So we've got this enormous estate now of marine parks around Australia, which are um, reducing our ability to supply seafood now and into the future. Um, a lot of the logic from behind those was um, was pretty questionable in my view, but that's perhaps for another day. Um, we're also seeing areas closed um, for commercial fishing to allow these so-called recreational fishing sanctuaries, um, and these increasingly are rolled out around the country. Um, you can get fishery closures. Now, the Atlantic salmon isn't a wild fishery, of course, um, but, but here's a great example from just within the last fortnight where a large area off eastern, um, eastern Tasmania has now been closed to Atlantic salmon farming um, um, well, forever, who knows. Um, and that was all driven by lack of, effectively, by lack of community support for salmon farming and indeed um, you know, direct community opposition to salmon farming. Um, and it also impacts on the markets, and markets ultimately affect the price and therefore the, um, the you know, ability of commercial operations to exist. And I think it's quite an interesting contrast, the, you know, the market support for, say, dairy farmers. Um, um, and we, you know, there's often campaigns or, or people promoting just how great dairy farmers are, local communities and, and that sort of thing, and that'll affect the, the market um, for, for dairy. And it's a very different story or impression which you get from seafood. Um, okay, so there doesn't seem to be that support for commercial fisheries and I just wanted to sort of go through why perhaps there's so much less support for commercial fisheries than um, there is for, uh, well there is overseas. Um, one of the things I think is important is um, just the amount of seafood which is produced in Australia and how, where it actually goes to, the fact that most of our seafood we produce is exported overseas rather than being supplied locally. Um, this is where the talk's increasingly looking like my holiday snaps, but I've also um, recently went to Kuwait, so this is a picture up here. 
Um, Kuwait, of course, is an oil-rich country, very wealthy. They can import as much seafood as they want, really, from anywhere in the world they would like. Um, and yet there's this enormous support there for the local fishing industry and they really want that to prosper and they just like the idea of having local producers supplying local seafood. Same in Korea, um, where uh, the government there is, is helping the local squid producers replace their lights with different sorts of lights. But the, the point is there, you've got a lot of support behind the squid producers because they're supplying squid back into Korea um, and helping provide them with local fresh seafood. <coughs> um, and Maine, of course, I've already spoken about that. So the key there is the seafoods being um, um, being fed in locally rather than exported. This is always a challenge for producers because if you find a, a highly valuable market overseas, um, it would make business sense to export the product to the highest price that, or to the, the best paying market that you can get. Um, but the downside on that is you can also lose community support. Um, the gas industry, of course, is facing that right at the moment, um, and um, there's not a lot of love for the gas industry in the community right at the moment, and the government's stepped in and, and reduced some of the supply that's going overseas because people quite rightfully are saying this is a, a community-owned asset and we need some of that to meet our own energy needs. Um, so this is actually something Australian producers can do something about. Here's a great example. Western Australia um, this year started um, quarantining some of their production and, and pushing and requiring that production to go into the local market. So there's something you can do. It seems to me a very sensible thing to do, um, particularly with something like lobster, which people value very highly um, in Australia. <clears throat> um, interestingly, though, also, um, something... Uh, it's interesting also, I think, just that a lot of our... Um, production in Australia, we, we actually have a management objective to reduce supply to local consumers. So to explain what I mean here, um, here's something I saw in the media just around Easter time. People were complaining about the high price of seafood and the lack of supply um, into local markets of locally produced seafood. But interestingly, um, if you look at the Commonwealth Government's um, uh, um, policy and guidelines for their harvest strategies, and in fact it's not just the Commonwealth Government, it's all jurisdictions across Australia have this to some extent. Um, we're increasingly reducing supply, producing production of seafood below the levels that would be at its maximum sustainable levels to try to increase the profitability of the commercial operations. Um, so that's great for the commercial producers, but not so great for the local consumers. Um, and a consequence of that, I think, is perhaps less local and public support for our fishing industries. I just think this is something which we perhaps need a more nuanced view in Australia, thinking about which fisheries we should be trying to target um, a maximum profitability of the commercial industries versus some fisheries perhaps we should be placing more emphasis on, on supplying food into local markets and satisfying consumers. Um, something like abalone, which is mainly headed for overseas markets, um, and I think most people there would be really happy if the Chinese or the Japanese or whoever are buying it in an overseas market finish up having to pay more. That would seem to make good sense for Australia. Um, perhaps something, though, perhaps a different approach might be more appropriate for something like blue grenadier, um, which is a, um, you know, a fairly middle of the range kind of fish harvested in Australia and fed into local markets and perhaps a species like that we might be thinking more about the consumers rather than always about the, uh, the economic yield to the producers. Um, I thought this was a great quote along that lines um, by Jay Leno who's a comedian. Give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and he'll eat for a lifetime. Teach a man to create an artificial shortage of fish and he'll eat steak. So he's you know, making the point that people switch off fish entirely, but in the context of this talk, the real issue is you'll not only the person will not only stop eating fish and eat steak, but also they'll stop caring if commercial fisheries get shut down with MPAs or recreational sanctuaries or eco campaigns or whatever else is a, is a problem for the operators. Um, <clears throat> where um, um, employment can be viewed as both a cost and a benefit, um, depending on whether you're someone who's paying for it or someone who's getting employed. Um, in Australia, it's, I'll give you an example here from our lobster fishery. So this is Australian, well, the Southern Rock Lobster Fishery, which I do a lot of my work on. At the moment, the beach price is about $65 a kilo. Now, if you're a lobster fisher and you are a, a leasey fisher, to go catch a kilo of lobsters, you've got to pay someone who else who owns the quota unit $50. So the first $50 of the $65 of revenue goes to pay someone else, and the remaining $15 or so is what runs the business. 
Um, so that $15 filters out into the community through employment and through, through downstream supplies and so on. But most of the, the revenue that comes in goes straight back out again in terms of rent. In Maine, um, they take a very different approach where they try to have zero rent and they try to maximise the level of employment in that fishery. Um, from the outside, you might say it's a very inefficient fishery. They've got far more people working than what they'd need to, um, but it does generate a whole lot more employment. So I'm not particularly saying any situation is right or wrong, but certainly what is clear to me, though, is the situation in Maine, um, where they're trying to maximise the employment, certainly does seem to create a lot more community support for the fishery than what we'd have in Australia. Um, but we do try to reduce employment in Australian fisheries. It might sound strange, but this is the Victorian Act and within their objectives of the Act, it's quite clear they want to facilitate the rationalisation and restructuring of the fishery. That means, in fact, reduce employment. That's the way it's been interpreted. Um, and I saw an opposite approach in Indonesia last year where the minister there, um, in fact, was, was creating incentives for catch to be shifted away from their larger boats to smaller boats. So that was reducing efficiency, if you like, but also increasing employment. Um, so whether you think that's a good economic process or not, we could debate, but what's, what certainly wasn't debatable, it was crowd pleasing. She's become a very popular fishery minister by increasing employment rather than increasing profitability of the commercial operators. Um, there's also issues in some parts about who can become a commercial fisher. Um, I, I'm not sure how big a deal this is, but it's certainly true that um, the commercial fishing industry in Australia at the moment is, is a very difficult industry to get into. It's a very high barriers to entry in terms of cost. Um, other countries, the US um, and Maine lobster here again, um, think that access to a fishery is just a fundamental right. And so anyone who lives in Maine below certain limits, so they, you have to be below 18 years of age and you've got to work a year or two on a boat or whatever, you've got to pass these hurdles. But essentially, if you want to, anyone in Maine can become a commercial fisher, and that's um, you know that sort of equality and equity um, goes a long way towards their their local acceptance and support for the commercial industry. Um, there's also the point about then who. So if we do have situations where profits, this large amount of rent is generated, there's issues about who gets it. Um, this is a bit like in some countries of the world where we have um, oil producing countries. Um, Alaska produces a lot of oil and in Alaska there's massive support for the oil industry because the, there's rents that are generated from that industry and it pays for all their services and the, the community doesn't pay any tax. Um, so in Australia the rents that are generated are all private, there's no payment for access to the commercial fisheries and I just think there's perhaps a, a different, you know, there's, there's clearly differences there which would influence the way people feel about the fisheries. Tokelau um, generates around $6,000 per capita um, through through generating rents from their commercial fishery. So they run a highly efficient tuna fishery, all the rents come back in and that pays for all the government service just to this tune of about $9,000 per person. So that's a lot. Um, and in Tokelau you can bet they're very supportive of their commercial industries. Um, and the last point I was going to make here, there's also a growing issue in Australia where people dislike um, you can see this, they, there's, there's concern about foreign ownership and corporations and that, that impacts on acceptance of commercial industries, commercial fishing industries in Australia. Um, here's a story from Alaska, classic you know, fishing family, here's a daughter fishing with her dad, um, so that's the, just a two person fishing business, um, small operation, they've got their American flag flying in the background there, so it's all you know, great local stuff that they love over there. Um, and you could contrast that to the situation in Australia and the response to the trawler where people were, talked about the fact that it was a foreign owned operation and it was a big corporation. So people just don't like that and that impacts on the, the acceptance of commercial production in Australia. Um, it's a big deal. The commercial rock lobster fishery where I said I do most of my work and people talk about this all the time. They're concerned about the way that the ownership is increasingly shifted to offshore people, <coughs> offshore quota owners. Um, or people living outside the jurisdiction and that there's no payment back into the community um, through the rents. Indonesia has a similar issue and they're solving it just by putting a charge on, on um, the fisheries if there is, is some level of foreign ownership. Um, we have some provisions for that in some legislation in Australia. Western Australia has some foreign ownership provisions although there's never been any um, act, uh, enactment of that as far as I've been able to see. Um, so foreign ownership is something else. Um, um, which is an issue perhaps for Australian fisheries and the fact that um, it can lead to public opposition. So just to wrap up then, these are simply the list of the main things which I think are perhaps holding back some of our production. The first two, um, 
are ones which we can't do anything about. That's just the way things are. But the bottom ones um, are actual issues where there are some uh, perhaps way which we could do some things differently and perhaps um, we could expand production in the future. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. <coughs> so we're not... Um, we're thanks very much for <laughs> <laughs> the presentation, yeah. Caleb. Um, we're just waiting to see if we get some questions coming in. Um, online. We don't have any at the moment, but it just may take a second. Sure. Perhaps while they're coming in, can I keep talking for a couple? You can. You can. I just want to make so I, so all the ones with stars on them there are things I said we could do something about. And I think I gave examples of all of those apart from the high biodiversity. So we've got this problem that if you go fishing in the top part of Australia, um, you get you, know, you get numerous species rather than just one and that would make it hard to, to deal with things. That's something I think um, we may be able to solve in the future just with better supply chains and better logistic management. Um, so that's why I put a star against that one as something which perhaps we might be able to change. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Well, right. it looks like we don't have any questions right. coming in today, Caleb. Um, if anybody does have any questions um, to come in, you can still pop those in the chat facility and I'll be able to send those to you, Caleb, and you may want to let me know an answer and I can type yep. it back in. Yep. So that would be fantastic. Cool. Um, yep. So thank you so much for your time today. As we said, this entire um, webinar has been recorded and we'll be sending a link to everybody who's signed in in the coming days. Thanks very much. Good, thanks.